This is the second video covering the transition to multi-engine flying. If you haven't watched it, I recommend you watch the first one, Multi-Engine Principles, as that covers turning tendencies in the critical engine. In the second one, we're going to be covering VMC and engine and operative procedures. VMC is the minimum controllable airspeed when the critical engine is inoperative. If you're flying below VMC, this will result in a loss of directional control. In an engine failure, the operating engine causes a yaw towards the inoperative one. But when you have full rudder in and you can't stop that yaw, you've lost directional control. So now we'll have a look at what it looks like to crash due to VMC. VMC is a critical airspeed in multi-engine airplanes, but it ends up being lethal if you fly below it at low altitudes because you don't have enough altitude to recover from it. We're going to see an airplane enter the frame with its left engine inoperative. The right engine is causing a left yaw, so when he tries to turn left, the high thrust at slow speed causes the airplane to yaw and roll further towards the inoperative engine, leading to a crash because he doesn't have enough altitude to recover. So now I'm going to give you a VMC demonstration, which will show the entry and recovery procedure to avoid being that guy. The actual speed of VMC will always be changing depending on the conditions of the atmosphere and different aspects of the airplane like CG, weight or thrust. So you should use directional control as your guide to knowing when you're about to hit VMC. So to demo this, we reduce power on the critical engine and we increase the power on our good engine. And this simulates an engine failure in the worst scenario where we're not able to feather it. So now what we're doing, we're maintaining a zero side slip condition and we're raising the nose up to bleed off our airspeed. And you'll find that as you get slower and slower, you're going to have to increase the amount of rudder input you're using in order to maintain a directional control. Eventually, you run out of rudder, and this is when we've hit VMC, and the airplane starts yawing towards the inoperative engine, and we lose control. So on this, you have to spin recovery to get out of this, and then I'll reset, and we'll show how to exit from VMC correctly. Alright, so another VMC demo, this time with the correct recovery. So we reduce power on the critical engine, increase power to a maximum continuous on our good engine, and we start raising the nose and bleeding off our airspeed, just like before. As we're slowing down, we're going to maintain that zero side slip condition by increasing our rudder and aileron input into the operating engine. So when we reach that point where we lose directional control, we have two problems we need to fix. The first is low airspeed, and the second is thrust asymmetry. We solve the airspeed problem by lowering the nose, and we solve the thrust problem by reducing power on the good engine. Now we're starting to reach the end of the right rudder we can use into the operating engine, and we're about to hit VMC. So as the airplane starts yawing towards the inoperative engine, we're going to reduce power on our good engine and lower the nose to regain enough airspeed until we're away from VMC. And once you're away from VMC, you can increase the power back in the operating engine and resume best rate of climb speed. The main effects of losing your engine is that you lose performance and control. So if you lose an engine in a twin, you'll lose 50% of your engine power, which could mean losing over 90% of your climb performance. The remaining engine also creates asymmetric thrust, which negatively affects the directional control which you need to counteract using aileron and rudder. To avoid losing directional control, you want to hold your best rate of climb speed at a minimum, and you also want to be in a zero side slip condition with a few degrees of bank into the operating engine. By keeping the ball centered with an engine failure, you're actually in a side slip and therefore in uncoordinated flight. Instead, aim to be in a zero side slip condition by using rudder to split the ball in two by that line. This will maximize your performance and directional control. Whenever you have an engine failure, you'll follow this mantra. You'll first maintain directional control, then you'll set your mixtures, propellers and throttles to the full position. Then you'll bring the flaps up and the gear up. Then you want to identify the dead engine by looking for your dead foot, and this is the one that's not on the rudder. Then you'll verify the dead engine by pulling back the throttle for it to idle. Then you can troubleshoot it to try and fix it, or feather it to reduce drag. Finally, you'll secure the engine, and if you need to, you can drop ordnance to reduce drag further. Now if you've lost an engine, you're going to have to deal with a single engine landing. So treat it just like a normal landing, but remember to not use more than half flaps, 
You can have a slightly faster approach speed if you like, but just make sure it's a stable approach because you don't want to have to do a single engine go around. Now we'll demo the engine failure and the single engine landing. So here we are, flying along, flying along, all fat, dumb and happy. When you get shot up by a fighter or ground fire, or just running the engine too hard, suddenly we notice we've got a problem. You might see some fluctuations in RPM or oil pressure, but you don't want to rely on is manifold pressure. This is because when the engine fails, it'll revert to showing the ambient air pressure outside. So now that we've lost the engine, we maintain direction of control, increase the throttle, propellers, and mixtures to the full position. We want to verify that our flaps are up and our gear is up. Now we're going to identify our dead foot to determine the dead engine. So we look down, and it's our left foot that's not doing anything. So therefore, we're going to close the left throttle. The airplane's handling doesn't change, so that means we've verified correctly that the left engine is dead. Now we'll jump to feathering the engine, and then we'll look at how the blades change in external view. Now while the feathering process is going on, I want you to look at the propeller blades. And you can see that there's a lot of surface area showing right now, but as we progress through in the next few seconds, we'll start seeing that that surface area gets smaller and smaller. And this is because the system is aligning these propeller blades with the relative wind, and this will reduce drag. This will let you increase your performance, which is very important if you want to be able to stay airborne. Now going back to the cockpit, we're going to secure the engine. We do this by pressing the 1 key to select the left engine, and then the E key to turn everything off. Now as the sim goes through this process, you want to verify that your oil radiators and your water radiators will be completely close as well, and this way you'll minimize drag. Depending on the atmospheric conditions, like if it's hot or humid, you may not be able to maintain altitude even if you do everything right. So in this case, you'll have to ditch your ordnance as well if you've got it. And this will reduce drag even further. So we can get rid of the ordnance. Now we can focus on finding an airfield to make a single engine landing. Now while you're maneuvering, turning into the inoperative engine is not preferable because doing so will actually increase the speed of VMC. But as long as you're paying attention to your direction of control and you're carrying some extra airspeed, it's perfectly safe. With that said, it's always safer to turn into the operative engine, so make sure you do that if possible. So now let's go find an airfield to land at. Alright, so we've been flying along, we've made it back to our airfield, which is at 11 o'clock. The propeller is feathered and the engine is secured, so we're good to make our attempt at the landing. Notice that I'm flying at a reduced power setting and I'm able to maintain my altitude. This is only because of the current atmospheric conditions in the sim. So if it was really hot and humid, you would end up not generating as much engine power, so you may not be able to maintain altitude. Since I can, I'm going to extend the landing gear here. And because of the excess drag produced by the gear, we're going to slow down pretty quickly to around 220 km an hour. Now remember, like I said before, this is going to be treated just like a regular landing, but we're going to limit ourselves to no more than half flaps. This is because you're going to create a lot of induced drag with that, and you want to avoid that with only a single engine running. So we're getting a couple of degrees of flaps now. We'll make our circular path towards the runway. And I'm going to try and maintain a slightly higher approach speed of around 220 km per hour, keeping in mind that the normal approach speed for this airplane is going to be around 200 to 210. And since I am turning towards that inoperative engine, it's critical I keep the speed up. Now as we begin our turn towards final, we're going to get in the rest of those flaps to around half. And we'll continue turning towards the runway. Now you want to avoid the overbanking in this scenario, because the more you bank, the higher VMC is going to be, and the more likely it is that you're going to end up spinning out of control. However, you can see that I'm at a nice low thrust setting while maintaining my approach speed. So this means that there isn't as much asymmetric thrust going on, and I'm less likely to have a problem with VMC. So just like all of our landings, we have our aiming point, which we're flying towards at our approach speed. We're adjusting our pitch and power to get there. 
Now this is going to be a wheel landing. So I'm going to get close to the ground as the mains touch. I'm going to apply a bit of forward pressure and then cut the power. Applying the braking, keeping the tail wheel off the ground using forward pressure. As we start slowing down, we can slowly let the tail touch, holding full back pressure and full brakes until we come to a complete stop. Now if you're going to taxi on a single engine, you're going to use your power, but then you're going to need a lot of differential braking and rudder. In some cases, you may not be able to do it at all. That completes the second video on transitioning into multi-engine airplanes. If you enjoyed it, let me know in the comments below. Hit the like button, and don't forget to be a subscriber to get more videos.